Hello again. Last time I showed the implementation of the register file for my 8-bit CPU. The individual registers work. I can write a value, I can send a value to the 8-bit data bus, and I can send a pair to the 16-bit address bus. This time I want to tackle support for incrementing and decrementing. At work I'm known for interrupting people when they describe long and complicated solutions with a simple question. What problem are you trying to solve? Let me try to answer that here. My instruction set will have four particular instructions of interest. Increment, decrement, load from register address with post increment, and store to register address with post increment. Firstly, why have these at all? Incrementing and decrementing are actually really useful. Consider a simple loop that computes the sum of an arithmetic series. Without the simple decrement instruction, I'd have to get the ALU ready to subtract 1 from a number. As described in my first episode, choosing 8 registers means I had to make the ALU instructions 2 bytes long. I want to avoid the complexities of pushing a value to the ALU, then pulling it back simply to increment or decrement it. It's similar when writing to linear addresses. It's common to fill memory with a constant, or to copy memory, or to compute something sequentially. Adding 1 to a 16-bit number on an 8-bit CPU is complex. To be honest, I could add a way to move a constant to the ALU, although it's still really not any better. So the compromise is to put this extra feature in the register file. Let's check the requirements again. For a single register, it can be an increment or a decrement. I want the execution to complete within one cycle. These instructions don't need to support any concurrent read or write access. Finally, these instructions update the processor flags. For a register pair, it's only ever incrementing. Again, I want the instruction to complete within one cycle. They must work on the full 16-bit value, that is, carrying between the least and most significant bytes. I've not done the full pipeline design for load and store to memory, but I believe it is best to perform this increment concurrently with the read of the register pair as an address. Therefore I want to read the address before the increment takes place. Finally, these instructions don't update the processor flags. How can I implement this? Firstly, I could use counters that support a set operation, for example the 74193. As they are only 4-bit counters, I'd need 4 of them. Given I need to compute the flags, I'd need additional logic for the zero flag. The trickiest part is getting the timing right for it. There are several stages required, each with minimum timing requirements. Next, I could use an adder with a constant value. Again, I'd need four chips. The issue is that I'd still need that elusive 8-input NOR gate, which is no longer manufactured, and hence I'd have to use dual 4-input NOR gates and a 2-input AND gate, or some other combination. Therefore, I'm breaking one of my design rules. I'm going to use programmable logic. I think it's quite defensible. I'll need two chips. Zero and carry can be an output of the chip handing the least significant byte. Output enable is supported, so I can drive the same data input bus without more drivers. The negative side will be power usage. These chips use something like 40 milliamps when idle. Yes, unlike other CMOS chips that only consume energy when transitioning, they burn energy doing nothing. Please don't ask me why. I do know that a badly programmed chip can create internal shorts, but that consumes a lot more than 40 milliamps when it happens. Anyway, I do have a plan for this. If I start with the most complex case first, hopefully the simpler case will follow. Therefore, I will look at incrementing the address. Remember that this is a 16-bit operation. As noted before, the registers are split into two groups, one for even and one for odd. In this diagram I've omitted the read and write enable lines and the carry to make it simpler to understand. The unmodified values are sent to the address bus, as shown here, and the incremented values are sent as inputs back into the registers, and they will be latched on the next positive clock edge. This would appear good so far. However, when we also consider that the data input to the register file needs to be wired in, you can see that both the even and odd registers share the same input lines and are connected to two different outputs from the incrementers. 
This is called bus contention. Two outputs are trying to drive the same input. Not a good idea. The solution is to add a buffer to split the data inputs into two, as shown here. At a minimum, I need one either on the even or odd side, presuming the data input is already tri-state. When incrementing, the data input here must be in high impedance mode, that is, effectively not connected to anything. This buffer here must be disabled, and the incrementers must be enabled. This means the outputs of the two incrementers are not connected together. When data is to be written to the register from outside the register file, the data input must be active, that is driving zeros or ones. This buffer here is enabled, and these incrementers here are disabled. This then connects the data input to all registers, and the register that is to be written has its latch clocked. Now that address increment is solved, incrementing a single register can be considered a subset of the register pair problem. The incrementer connected to the correct register group is enabled, making the value increment on the next clock edge. The incrementer will additionally have to perform decrementing. Let's turn some of this theory into reality. For the least significant byte, the GAL will have to support increment and decrement. This is controlled by this extra input called DEC. When this is high, it will decrement, and when it is low, it will increment. It will have to take eight inputs, shown here. I'll put the result, shown here, and I'll put the carry and zero flags. I've left pin 4 here, available for power down mode, and I'll explain this more in detail later. I've generated the expressions using my GAL program that I wrote for my video output project. It optimizes expressions given an arbitrary function. Just like on that project, the higher bits have lots of product terms and can only be placed on certain outputs. As seen here, they're not quite in order. Unlike my video project, I'm using tri-state outputs, hence these .t and .e suffixes. Active low output enable seems to be a common idiom, so I'll copy that, and I called it NOE here. Let's just check some of these expressions. The expression for carry does seem to make sense. If decrementing, it's all these products that are being summed, and the carry is set unless the input is zero. If incrementing, it's this product term that is used, and it is only set if the input is 255. Likewise, for the zero flag, if we're decrementing, the input has to be 1, so therefore the output will be zero. And if we're incrementing, the input has to be 255, such that the output is zero. For the most significant byte, the GAL will only increment if the input carry is set. That is, it must preserve the value unless the least significant byte overflowed. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as the other GAL. I'm using the XG Pro software to program them. I mentioned the power down mode of the ATF22V10 earlier. When this mode is disabled, pin 4 is an ordinary input. When it's enabled, setting pin 4 high will put the device into a low power mode where the existing state will be retained and all changes to inputs will be ignored. Setting it low will restore the active state. This is useful because the power draw in this inactive mode is around 100 microamps, that is almost 1000 times smaller than the active mode. This mode is enabled by fuse number 5893, which I'm just going to edit here. So initially it's zero to say that it's disabled. If I set it to one, then the mode will become enabled. Now I had to update the XG Pro software to be able to find this extra chip with a CEXT ending on it to be able to program them. So I should be able to just program this now. And I'm just going to verify this. Excellent, that worked. OK, both chips are programmed. I've put labels on them because I'll quickly forget which one is which. Let's start with a simple breadboard to check that each chip works before proceeding. I have a Pico here controlling the input value and reading the output value. Four additional outputs control the power down mode. The output enable, a latch, which I'll explain later, and the increment decrement choice. Two additional inputs read the carry and zero flags. 
I'll start by testing the least significant byte chip first. Again, I've got MicroPython on the Pico. I've set up a quick helper class to control the pins. Let's test incrementing first. So I'll set the mode to zero. I'll disable the power down and I'll enable the output. Remember I had active low, so zero means to enable. I'm going to set a value of 23 as an input and check the output. Good, it's 24. I'm going to check the carry and the zero flags. Neither is set, that's correct. I'll try setting an input of 255. The output is zero, that's correct. Both carry and zero are set, that's correct. Now I'm going to try decrementing, so I'll set the mode to 1. I'll set the input to 23. Let's check the output. 22, that's good. Let me check the flags. So carry is set and zero is not set. Remember I'm using 6502 style carry for subtraction, which is the inverse of a borrow flag. I'll check zero to see what happens when we wrap around. Good, we get 255. And as for the flags, they're both zero. That's correct. Now my script also lets me try all combinations. So let me just scroll back up to the top. So in mode zero, that should be incrementing. The first column is the input. The second column is the output. Then it's the carry and the zero flags. So we can see the output is always one greater than the input. That's good. And then the two bits are only set when the input was 255 and the output is zero. Mode one is decrementing. And we can see that the output value is always one less than the input. The carry bit is zero only when the input is zero. That's because we had to borrow. And then the zero is only set when the input is one and hence the output was zero. So this looks good. Now I've connected the most significant byte chip. I'm going to just run through all the combinations and just check it all works. So mode zero means don't alter the value and we'll see that the input and the output are the same. The zero and carry flags are not programmed so they come out as zeros and everything is all the same through all the values. In mode one, we're going to perform the increment and we can see that the values are incremented all the way down. So that looks good. On to the tricky part. I want to use the power down mode to reduce energy usage. Let's examine the inputs required when an increment is performed. On the positive clock edge, this power down mode is disabled. At the end, it is re-enabled. In my register file design, the registers latch at the midpoint of the clock cycle, that is, on the negative clock edge. Part of this is because the value on the inputs must be valid for at least two nanoseconds after the latch goes high. This is explained in the datasheet here. This is less of a problem when latching the outputs of SRAM, for example, as the outputs remain valid for some time when switching addresses. Now consider the output enable. Because the data input is tri-state, this chip must go to high impedance mode when powered off. This is shown here. However, it remembers the output enable state that was in use before power down. If I disable the output at the end of this clock cycle, the propagation delay of inputs to output disable is potentially too large. Although I have to admit the datasheet is confusing here. Then as an alternative, can I disable the output at the midpoint of the clock cycle? Is the output valid long enough after disabling such that the latch can operate? I believe so. According to the datasheet, there is a minimum of two nanoseconds to propagate inputs to disable an output and the latch needs the data valid for two nanoseconds after the clock goes high. This is pretty tight timing. I really don't want to add a delay line chip here, at least in part because I feel like it's eating garlic to ward off vampires. Unless you have the data, it's verging on superstition. How can I collect the data? So, to end this video, here is the same test setup, but with the latch connected. The output of the GAL from here goes into the latch and the output of the latch goes into the Raspberry Pi. I switched from MicroPython to C because I want tight timing. 
the Pi runs at 133 MHz, so a single cycle is around 7 nanoseconds. The code runs a clock cycle to perform an increment, then a clock cycle with the chip powered down. If the value from the latch is invalid, it logs this to the serial output. Now let's run it. The output is strangely silent, showing that it's working just fine. Removing the output from the latch makes it print lots of violations, showing that my script is actually working. I think the timing will be absolutely fine. I've run this for several hours and didn't get a single violation. I'm not as far along in the implementation as I'd wanted, but I'm ready to integrate what I've designed into the register file breadboards. It was an interesting diversion into the fun world of gals programming and timing. Thank you again for watching. I hope it's interesting and possibly entertaining. I'm certainly learning a lot by making mistakes and fixing them. I hope that this new microphone is better too. I received constructive feedback that my old setup wasn't brilliant. Anyway, thank you and bye for now.